Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Head. Aisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. This week, we've got a great talk between two guys who don't necessarily have a ton in common musically, but who approach creativity in similar ways, and who happen to be great fans of each other's work. Mike Hadrius of Perfume Genius, and composer, performer, multi-hyphenate Max Richter. Hadrius, whom you've hopefully heard on the TalkHouse podcast in the past, has been recording and performing under the name Perfume Genius since 2008, and he's one of those artists whose music just inexplicably gets better with each passing day, even when you think it couldn't. His records are this incredible combination of fearlessness and joy, whether he's singing about dealing with homophobia or just making bodies move. The latest Perfume Genius record, which came out right as COVID was entering the world's consciousness, bears the fantastic title, Set My Heart on Fire Immediately. Perfume Genius will start playing shows again next month. Check out perfumegenius.org for dates. And check out a little bit of On the Floor from his latest album. I'm trying, but still I close my eyes. As for Max Richter, I could spend far more than this limited time allows just going over his resume. From contributing to a classic Future Sound of London album back in the 90s, through his incredible score for HBO's The Leftovers, to half a dozen other things, the musician-composer has had an incredibly full plate for years. He composed an eight-hour minimalist classical piece called Sleep, which was performed for audiences that were provided with beds and encouraged to, you know, fall asleep. It's also now an app. His latest release, just out last week, is called Exiles, and it features a lengthy new track that he composed for a ballet, alongside some reimaginings of pieces he's composed over the years. Check out a little bit of Flowers of Herself from Exiles. In this conversation, Richter and Hadrius talk about how making music is about articulating what can't otherwise be articulated, where to start when you're working on a soundtrack, and the joys of being influenced by other music. It's a pretty music-heavy conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Mike. (laughs) Good to see you. Are you in the studio? I am, yeah. Uh, Well, it's kind of work in progress, but yeah. We've just kind of done this thing we've been thinking about for like 20 years, we figured out, to get a place in the country and have a place to live and a studio. So we've built this kind of, it's like an art farm. So we've got like studios and like a garden and stuff to, you know, place to grow things Mm -hmm. and like nuts and berries and forest. And it's kind of amazing, actually. Yeah, that sounds like the dream to me. It kind of is. It's a bit spooky because we've been thinking about it for such a long time. And now it's real or kind of nearly real. It's kind of got a spooky unreality, even though, you know, we're here and we're recording and we're doing it. I've always dreamt of somewhere that, well, it's actually exactly what you just described. Once you're out of town, there's space, which you can never get in town. You, You know, we can get people down and just kind of, there isn't that sort of you're on the clock the whole time, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, there goes another day in the studio and it's, you know, it feels like a kind of an open creative space, which is, it's just brilliant. Yeah, some breath in between everything, some room. Yeah, so we've been locked down out here and it's weird, there's kind of nothing happening out here, sort of ever, really. In a way, it's sort of no different from like normal times. I kind of had the opposite experience. Before we lived in LA, we were living in Tacoma, which is like, 30 minutes south of Seattle, not a big town, not a lot going on. And we moved to L.A. specifically to be more social, be more outside, be more with people, make it easier for collaborations and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden lockdown happened. We're in this big city that's completely, you know, shut down. It was very strange. 
it would have been a lot easier to phase into that, I think, in Tacoma because we had a bigger house, we had space. Yeah. So your record, Set My Heart on Fire, that's a year old, right? Mm -hmm. It came out, I can't even remember what happened now, but we were locked down when it came out. That's weird, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you couldn't, did you play it at all? Did you go and play it at all? Have you played it ever? I did a lot of rehearsals with the band to prepare for some live streams. And we did the live stream. I mean, it was all playing it and performing it, but it didn't feel quite like, and it wasn't what it was supposed to be, you know, because no one was there. I still got the feeling of singing and performing, but. Mm. It's a lovely record, actually. Thank you. Yeah, it really is. It's funny, I was thinking, uh, we lived in Berlin a long time, and something about the atmosphere of the record reminds me of a place in Berlin. Yeah. We lived in Mitte, um, and there's a, there's a place there which is a dance hall which has been there since, I think, before the Second World War even. It's a bit of an institution. It's called Klerchen's Ballhaus. They do sort of tea dances, and then they do sort of experimental music and hmm. all kinds of stuff. I went to a sort of 24-hour performance of... How exciting vexations there. And it's really sort of a fun place. And you walk in in the afternoon, there are people sort of, you know, waltzing with a tiny orchestra. And it has this lovely acoustic. And the record has a, had an acoustic which sort of reminded me of it. Hmm. Um, and the colours in the record. Yeah, anyway, so, I mean, it's, it's lovely. It's really lovely. How much do you normally play? Do you play a lot? I mean, we've sort of been locked into the same routine for like a decade now, where <laughs> we probably tour like a year and a half at least. Like the bulk of the like really major tourings, about a year and a half. And then we'll do some one-off kind of pickup things. But essentially, I make another record and then do that again. Right. <laughs> you know? So that's your kind of rhythm. And there's been great things about being pulled out of that. Mm. But it also feels very strange. It feels, um, you know, because tour was where I got a lot of new information. It was kind of set up for me that that's when I'm social, that's when I'm seeing the world, that's when I'm talking to people, you know. And then the at-home part was very isolating and for writing, I felt, you know what I mean? I kind of would go in very internal. And so to have that structure be taken from me, I didn't really know how to make room for each of those things in a healthy way. <laughs> yeah. I always think, like, playing live is, um, you learn so much about what you've made, right, from putting it, in front of people and connecting it to people. And I, I miss that, actually. I mean, the record that I did, I guess it was Voices. It was about, I think it was May, June last year as well. It, it, we were just sort of at the beginning of the whole lockdown story. I guess we played it a couple of times before then, but that was before the release. And we just had this one radio show to kind of play it, and that was around Christmas time. And apart from that, we really haven't played it. And I've, I've really missed that experience of people in a room together. It's not that you take it for granted, but we're used to it, right? We're just kind of used to it, just having people listen and, you know, just hearing all the, you know, all that, that kind of feedback. And for that to go away, it's hard. Yeah, it's a strange feeling. I mean, I'm lucky that I work in a way that I can make something and share it. And I, didn't, I don't necessarily have to be there, but I do, <laughs> I do like being there. It's confusing honestly, because I resented parts about having to tour and it was not a very sustainable thing. And I'm getting older and I just, I don't know. I can't really just grind like that anymore and maintain some sort of excitement and energy, you know? Yeah. But I miss it now. Like I'll, I'll go to some shitty bar in Denver now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm. How did you get started in music? What made you want to do it? I have kind of a weird story. I didn't write a song until I was 25. Mm -hmm. And I was actually listening to one of your records a lot before I wrote my first song. Really? Wow. I was listening to Blue Notebooks a lot. Wow. Yeah. I don't know exactly how it happened. I was listening to your record. I was listening to Stars of the Lid record a lot too. I mean, that's like a heavy memory to me. I don't really know how to explain it, but I remember those your record and the Stars of the Lid record being really heavy on my mind before I started writing. And the music I wrote is completely not um, <laughs> like either of those records at all. Mm -hmm. But I just woke up one day and I had one of my mom's old laptops and like a shitty mic, like a plastic webcam mic and wrote a song. And then I just never stopped after that. That's wonderful. So my first record was Home Recordings and then it's grown since then. I think your work has a kind of, um, there's a wonderful through line in it actually. 
and in a way, the through line is it's kind of everywhere, but in a in a really in a lovely way. I just sort of enjoy the playfulness and the kind of go anywhere sort of. I don't know how to how to describe it, but it all has that quality, which I think is. Um, so, I mean, it's that's such a valuable quality because actually that kind of gets eroded out of people. Oh, for sure. The older you get, the harder it is to kind of maintain that spirit. That's what being getting older to me feels like is me essentially trying to get back to how I was before the world showed up. It's very intentional in my music that I, I think I've naturally always kind of been like that, which can seem kind of chaotic, I guess. But it's making room in my music to kind of go from thing to thing to to hold competing energies at the same time and but have some like grace to it or I don't know some drama to make a, a story out of it that is cozier than you know just sometimes existing like that is I think there's a Patti Smith line isn't there about where she says in in art and dreams you may proceed with abandon which I really I just really like that you know I mean music offers that space, doesn't it? It offers a space in the world where you can just do it. And that's it, you know, you've done it. I often think that, you know, one of the reasons I, I'm involved with music at all is because it offered a place where things could make sense in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That little space, which is the piece of music, can be a place where things can kind of make sense. Uh, at least to you, which is, I mean, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And the world at large obviously kind of doesn't make sense kind of most of the time. That resonates with me a lot. It's just like a few minutes where something is, I don't know, actually exists. Like some something I can't articulate, something that I can't um, quite get to or have difficulty with. That's, I guess, why I make songs. Because <laughs> I can't really talk about them. Exactly. What they're about, you know. Well, and it's physical, too. I was thinking, when you were talking, I was thinking about listening to your music and how it's, like, felt physically, like, in the body. Mm. And so it's not just, like, ideas for me or, you know, just letting my brain wander. It's, like, my body, too. And that's rare to have a, that kind of dream world or that space in between things for you to be able to physically feel that yeah i definitely feel that a piece of music is is sort of a it's like a place which has got physical properties almost the making of the music the writing of the music is a way to kind of understand that place deeply and all its properties and how it feels and that's why i think the sonics are so important you know in terms of just the tactile how things actually just the, the feel of the sounds which is why I'm kind of obsessed with that. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I'm not a technician at all. I have a lot of ideas of how I want things to be, but then how I'm capable of communicating them, it's very different. So I find little workarounds until I end up going to the studio with people that kind of realize things. But then there are accidents I find that do something, you know, that maybe my shitty lo-fi version of it, we end up keeping on the record a lot. Do you have, like, regular folks who you like to work with on that side, like producers and people like that because the sonics on your records are really beautiful thank you they've got this sort of polychrome texture which i really i'll take that i really love it actually <laughs> it's um there's kind of ear candy and that's that's one thing but it's but it is it isn't that really it's like it's it's exactly that sort of polychrome sort of structures are, are just lovely so how do you get to that that ear candy to me is like the real physical quality like you need Everything has to be in harmony with each other, but you need everything to settle exactly where you're expecting sometimes. And then you need parts of it that is going to throw you off and to fuck it up a little bit. I mean, I guess the quality of the sound could do that too, beyond just the lyric and the, the song. But I guess I work with people that can pick up pieces that I can't, <laughs> you know. Blake Mills, my producer, the last couple of years, he's, we work, I think we work together well because we want the same things, but we come from very different places. We love music in the same way. We love a lot of the same music, but the way we make it is different, you know? And he's very good at finishing. I'm more of a, I, I like ideas. I like sketching things. I like um, trying. And then I I don't really like finishing. I'd rather just <laughs> do something else. And he's, he's good at um, 
Which finishing is important because in the end, I'm not the one that's going to be listening to this music. <laughs> so I should be packaged for other people. But you make, I mean, you make the record you want to hear, right? First, isn't it? I mean, you make it in a way for yourself as well. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's like you make the record you want to hear, but it doesn't exist. So you have to make it, right? Yeah. So that's part definitely true, I think. How do you make a record that other people want to exist? Like when you, because I signed on to write music for a movie, which I've never done before. And one of the things I'm nervous about is talking about music with people that aren't musicians, trying to explain, sharing things where I, maybe me and other musicians can see where these things are going to go. I mean, movies, are, it's an interesting thing. It's so much about the people involved and the personalities and what the relationships are. I just sort of feel like it's this, it's a conversational process, really. And you kind of have to have something to talk about. I, I just always just make a bunch of things. Because, you know, film, you know, visual people, I mean, why would they know how to talk about music? So you've got to have, like, an object that everyone can sort of just react to. Um, I don't know. It's a real puzzle scoring. I didn't ever study how to do it. So I, I basically don't know how to do it. But I know what sort of makes sense to me. And that is to try and kind of discover the sound of the, you know, the, that kind of sonic fingerprint, that world that feels like it lives in that world, that it's kind of inevitable to that world. I mean, that feeling of inevitability, that's something I sort of spend a lot of time trying to find, either in movies or in other things, really. Just generally, I love that feeling that it could only be this way. You know, I, I just think there's something really, that kind of existential safety, if you mm -hmm. like. <laughs> well, how do you gauge that, though? How do you know when you've found that thing? But I think you do. You do, I don't know how, but you do, right? I do, yeah. Somebody asked me that recently. They're like, how do you know when whatever you made is good? And I was like, I just, it's not a great answer, but I just do. Well, you just kind of, you have that feeling of like, now I'm just going to stop doing this because I've, I've done it. You know? Yeah. Or this is what it's supposed to be, whether it's good or not. Exactly, right. Yeah. And that's, that's okay, right? It's energetic sometimes. It's not really have anything to do with the thing itself. <laughs> It's more my like negotiations with it. That's why it's some, if I do ever get sort of tripped out, it's because I, I know that, you know, just because I feel that so this is the right thing, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing, especially when I have a lot of, you know, at home, that's fine. With myself, I like operating that way, but the longer I do it, the more people are in my ear, the more things are at play to make you second guess that all the time. And it's, it's become a real job for me to, um, stay in touch with my mechanism that figures that out. I don't know if this is some kind of strange psychosis or if I'm lucky, but I always have this feeling whenever I'm doing something that, um, that no one's ever going to hear it anyway. So I might as well just kind of do what I do because that really, I mean, like when I did Memory House, I thought that was like, ta-da! <laughs> uh, but in fact, no. <laughs> I mean, it's like basically no one heard it. Hardly anyone. Hardly anyone. I heard it. Oh, uh, well, well, thank you. You were one of the, <laughs> one of the few. And after that, I, I kind of thought, oh, well, so no one is really listening. So I can just keep doing exactly what I feel like doing. And that sort of stuck with me. It's given me some kind of a freedom. I feel like I have to cultivate that. And it takes a, it's a long process of me and not having that until I do. And I think those are the same thing. Like I know every time I try to write, I'm gonna have to shake off a bunch of pressures and memories, you know, of what this is like or what it, and eventually I do. And I get to someone that's a lot more like hyper-present. When you're working, do you, are you working, like, do you think about where you've been? Like in the previous projects? Is that part of it? Or are you, are you kind of, is it like a blank slate? I mean, I can't really plan for any of it. It just ends up being whatever it is. But there is, usually in the beginning, I do something that's like what I've already done. And that's that never feels like the thing. It, whenever it shifts. But I still, when it's fun to do that, when it's fun to reference things I've already done, or to really intentionally improve something or fuck with something that's, that's already happened, I do it. Like I reuse lyrics or I kind of reference other songs. Not that anybody would care or even notice. But for me, um, it's fun to do that. Yeah. 
Well, music is also about other music, isn't it? That's something I, I actually really enjoy about music. You know, that all those connections, you know, either between, you know, like my own stuff into previous records and that kind of those connections back or, or into other music. Well, I've been trying to write, like, just write um, words, like stories recently. And I'm realizing that partly why I'm having a difficult time is that I'm not reading anything. You know, I when I make a song, I have a context because I'm an obsessive listener, too. And I'm very, you know, all over the place with my listening. And I make my own music. So when I make something, I have a sense of where it is for me, where it is for songs in general. I have a a sense of where it sits, you know, and it's hard for me to write with. And it's also kind of liberating at the same time, because I'd have no idea if it's good or bad. I kind of have, whether I'm right or wrong, when I'm writing a song, it's like this, is, I can, when I'm onto something, I know, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice feeling. That feeling of when the material starts to kind of do stuff, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? And it kind of takes off. Yeah. Then it feels like channeling a little bit. I mean, it's still work, and there's still a lot of math involved in it, but there are parts of it that just feel like letting it happen. What part does computers and technology and all of that, what's your relationship with that? Well, I write by recording, and I always have. In the same, you know, I have the same old laptop. I can't learn any new program. So, I mean, maybe it's old technology, I guess, older, older-ish. I think how I can write is that I'm making a little world first through effects, vocal effects, and I can play piano, sort of, you know? So, but I can make my piano sound like something. I can make my voice sound like a guitar or... I can make some weird, you know, alien choral thing without needing aliens that can sing, you know? <laughs> but beyond that, that's it. Like I have a microphone on my laptop and all my, you know, decade old plugins from GarageBand on like an old Mac laptop, but that's all I know about. What about for you? If I'm writing, I'm writing on a, kind of on a piece of paper, really. So it kind of goes on a journey, you know, the material. It, I mean, I, I like... Often I'll write at the piano or, or just on a, you know, at a table. But then obviously, yeah, it kind of gets involved with, with all the tech, kind of computers and stuff. And especially with movies, I mean, you have to, you have to be working with the sound, you know. And if it's like an orchestral thing, then they, they kind of want to hear an orchestra playing, you know, <laughs> yeah. a demo of, an, you know. <laughs> I, I was thinking it would be super fun to just show up to a director and just kind of with like a pile of paper on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That would be mm. super funny. That would, uh, that would be a short uh, engagement probably. But yeah, I mean, it's basically the bigger the projects are, the more people there are. And the more people there are who, who kind of, who sort of feel they have to say something about the music, they sort of don't really have anything, to, you know, to say. Um, and then that, that is a sort of, that can be quite the challenge, sort of trying to understand what's actually happening. Mm. And, um, <laughs> you know, are we getting anywhere kind of, so that's, that's the sort of, that's kind of quite, it can be quite interesting. To me, the soundtracking, I suppose, if you call it that, it feels like a physical thing because it's like making, this is all kind of wishy-washy stuff to talk about. <laughs> I feel like a hippie, but it's making it <laughs> be, um, felt like just having it be more full body brain I know how to talk about that and I know we all you know but until I have something and I guess that's kind of what you're saying it needs to have some sort of anchor like some footage some core sound that feels like the right starting place but so far it just feels like a lot of talking about what it can be mm. and then when I sit down to try to conceptualize it like out of the ether, I don't really know how. I mean, there's a million ways to do it. I mean, a lot of scores I've written, you know, kind of away from the pictures completely. And that can be, that can be really a good way because then you just, you sort of have a, I guess you're relating to the film in a different way, perhaps more to do with the kind of really what the, the project really is, is about rather than just the images. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's, it's just one of those things that I think... Um, once it starts happening, 
it'll be fine. So what are your favorite movie scores? Well, I think when I was in first or second grade, I went to Edward Scissorhands. And I, that's the first time I remember the music from a movie really sticking with me. It was also the first CD I ever bought was the Edward Scissorhands. Soundtrack. Really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That has that twinkly Celeste, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, and that's weirdly kind of campy but and really sentimental, but also very strange and hot, like kind of alien in the same way. The whole movie's kind of like that. And I love that combination. In David Lynch movies, when I got a little older, probably still too young to be watching them. <laughs> but that ha- kind of gave me the same thing. It sort of cut time in half when I would ever I would hear it. And whenever I would hear it un- not attached to the TV shows or the movies, I still was fully in the world whenever it, it came on, you know. Yeah, I think he, he uses music in a very interesting way, David Lynch. It's sort of out there, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I always remember seeing Blue Velvet as a kid, being absolutely just so terrified. <laughs> yeah. But the music is amazing against what's going on. This kind of very sort of gentle, rather sad sort of ballad. Mm-hmm. There's something really satisfying to that about, for me, just kind of reframing these really sweet, like, not um, pro- difficult at all <laughs> ballads, but making them kind of scary or making them fucked up, just fucking with them in some way. For some reason, even as a little kid, because Hairspray is another movie I love. I don't even remember the score, but that was made for kids, but there's some kind of icky, campy element to the movie too. And maybe maybe it's just sort of like an outsider equality or just feeling some sort of ickiness underneath everything <laughs> when I was a kid <laughs> and then kind of being in, enamored with it. But I like all that stuff existing at the same time. What are you working on now? I guess it's hard to talk about things as you're working on them. You're not supposed to. It's been um, slightly kind of been in this sort of blizzard of this build, finishing this place off. But I'm doing, yeah, I'm starting it. Uh, it's a TV show. Um, it's a 10-parter. It's nice, actually. Really good. It's kind of end of the world type show, but it's, you know, it's a nice journey. <laughs> I like that. I'm... I'm... I will be watching that. I think I've read and watched every post-apocalyptic story. It's sort of about the end of the world, but the end of the world is is sort of, that's not the main thing. It's mostly about the people and their their relationships and the feelings and all the, the chaos of their sort of slightly dysfunctional lives. But also it's the end of the world. <laughs> but that's not the main thing. It's, not, right. <laughs> it's like, we've got to sort this out. Well, um, everything feels like that right now sometimes a little bit. Must feel like that for young people even more so. Just sort of trying to exist and live in a world that's not set up for them, that's going to blow up. (laughs) And I can feel that in the things that they're making. They're a little more um, wild in a way that I, when I was that age, I don't think things were making. They're more angsty and in response to the world. It's a super hard time. And not just really about the, not just because of the pandemic, but because of everything else. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, the pandemic's like, oh, great, you know, and now a pandemic. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, it was already, you know, things, you know, politically, socially, in terms of economics, everything, all the systems are messed up. Yeah. They're all wrong. The whole sort of structure of the world that we've built is kind of wrong. Yeah. Pretty much. Well, and it, feel, it felt kind of biblical sometimes. Like, we had a earthquake, and I was like, this, this is another ingredient like something's something <laughs> is gonna happen, you know. I think for for kids, you know, who are growing up now, it's obviously a really challenging time. But also, I do like I do feel kind of hopeful though, for, in a way, because there is a kind of an activist spirit and an engagedness and a willingness to just be different and do things differently, which I think is really exciting. And you know that connectivity that you know we all live with now really in a way supports that i mean as well as i mean it's obviously has its challenges but i do feel kind of in a way hopeful but um yeah it's an interesting time it's an interesting time to try to make things too it really is i sometimes don't know how much of that to bring with me and how much of it to like set aside and then also sometimes i don't know if that's really irresponsible of me to do you know (laughs) so or if people are going to want to, f- to hear something that is not attached to it as a sort of freeing and sort of be liberated from it for five minutes or whatever. I don't know. I think, you know, if we sort of fast forward, I don't know, 20 years or something, will there be a sort of a 
pandemic era? Will there be like art, which is definitely feels like it's pandemic era? There might be in other parts of the world. I think there'll just be mass shootings in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> It'll just be constant gunfire. <laughs> that will be just our like... response. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Just exchange of uh, gunfire all the time. <laughs> yeah, strange times. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Should we call it on that happy note? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, looks really nice to talk to you. Yeah, nice to talk to you too. I'm a big fan. Thanks for listening to the Talk House Podcast, and thanks to Max Richter and Mike Hadrius, a.k.a. Perfume Genius, for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please take a dive into each of their catalogs. They are vast and full of treasures. This episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan, and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.